what's up? So, it's your girl Cran Cake Gabo. Hope you're good, Peachy Stella. And in a neat little bunch. Uh, yeah. Let's just get straight into the gist of this particular matter. There's gonna be a delay coming in for a season in the beginning of this video because uh, the sun is just at a particular angle right now and there's nothing I can do. I tried to eradicate it so it's not gonna happen. But uh, it'll be dealt with in due season. I can't just keep putting my hand there because I need to be able to drink my coffee. Anyway, uh, listen, all right, there is a, a devastating amount of spiritual war going on um, in the world at large, in my country, in the village, in the streets, in the town, on a tree. If at all it's a place on earth, there is war going on there. It's very hot. Mm. Okay, so I'm having coffee alongside. It's quite warm and I'm hoping that my phone does not overheat as a result. But if I open the door, that'll eradicate the, 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 the issue. But if I open the door, there's then the issue with the delay. Mm, that delay that I have to do that in order to overcome, but it's fine. <sighs> Give me half an hour and the delay will be gone. Okay, righty. So if I'm a little bit nasally, have mercy on a sister. I was blowing my nose a lot earlier. Listen, there is a severity of spiritual war going on literally every, every way. And I got this to say, right, <laughs> what is with the insistence upon going to hell? Like, you know what, guys? Like, I think so very much about hell because I'm scared for the lives of people I know and still care about to a certain extent going there due to my observation of their insistence on taking themselves there in spite of making like voluminous observations of the fact that they're going there it's, it's all very disturbing to look at <sighs> at some point I was lost okay and then I got found I, I can never really understand the level of rebellion in the ecosystem that encircles me i can't um because even before i got saved there was still some kind of trepidation about the existence of god in me and if anybody had rocked up and given me proof uh that god lives i wouldn't have hesitated i suppose they don't make them the same right human beings i suppose we, we don't get made from the same bucket from the same clay i don't know like i can't i can't do the mathematics i had to scratch my foot it was itching yeah i i, I literally uh, yo okay so there are two kingdoms and all the others on earth don't matter all right there is the kingdom of god and then there's the kingdom of satan um both got kings and you know what kingdom you work for when you walk in basic ways <laughs> there are certain things that determine what kingdom you belong to in fact, Galatians 5 will give you a nice unpacking of what each kingdom entails this clay. It's just going to be there because now I've got to use my hand to open the Bible. I don't even know what to tackle this from, like from what vantage point to, ta to tackle this particular issue. But we tackle it anyway. Did I apologize for my white cast sunscreen? I do. I apologize. I see it. It's layering. It's popping. And there's nothing I can do about it. It's just like this delay that's coming in from the right. Yes, alrighty, so, um, thank you, Jesus, we are in Galatians 5, I'm opening the door, because what, right, it's boiling, scorching hot, one of these days I'm not going to be able to do videos in my car, but then again, one of these days I'm not going to be coming from my car, because during the day, I am not going to be available, so I'll probably do my videos, hey, I don't know when, maybe still in the car, just in the evenings, I just, I really don't like that environment from which I, uh, under normal circumstances, record. Let's just get straight into it. So there are two kingdoms. One kingdom is defiled, while another is the baddest in the game. It's the real deal. It's Jesus, right? Um, so I just want to describe to you the works of both kingdoms and why anybody at all, when they have been given proof or evidence of, of the um, dying nature of the kingdom that they belong to, why they still stay in it. My, my, please, like I would really adore for you to just have my back. Um, Claire, be gone. I don't even know how to deal with it. And guys, good things in. Look, look, I could elevate my hand, but really, it's getting tired. My hand is getting super exhausted. Like, I, should, I just don't know. It's gonna get tired. I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy, like, severely with this lane. And I don't know why it's there today. Maybe it's because I don't generally come to record at this time, but also it's because summer's coming. And the sun is up a lot longer in the sky. 
Um, so all the, the, the seasonal changes and whatnot are all up in my grizz eye and it's all very it's all very unfortunate for me. There's literally nothing I can do. Is there anything I can do? There's nothing. Like I don't have like an umbrella or whatever just to put there in the villa to block this glare from just ransacking me. But anyway, let's just get straight into this thing. This is the Bible, just in case you were wondering. In particular, the version that I am utilizing is the King James. Uh, a lot of people stand by this and go so far as to claim that it's the only one that we should read. I'm not, however, a, Kim, a King James onlyist. I do believe in other versions. But right now, I'm reading from the King James. The one in my vehicle. And look at that, it's pink. <laughs> we love pink. Okay, cool. Mm, let's just get straight into this thing. Two kingdoms, one belongs to Satan, the other belongs to Jesus. The kingdom of the dark ones is done for. It has no future, um, but it's still ruminating in these streets. It's coursing through the veins of the earth like hemoglobin inside the human bloodstream. And it's just going to be a thing until the earth, um, you know, dies. But there's going to be respite for a thousand years in the middle. Not in the middle, at the very end there. Called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then there's going to be like... Um, a whole reignition of the kingdom of darkness doing a thing because God is going to give that permission. And then we're going to fight it one more time and then go to heaven. And then there's going to be the great white throne judgment and everybody is then going to go to where it is that I'm trying to like feverishly work hard to ascertain they don't go there. Hell. Mm. The rest of the planet is going to go to hell. Yes. Because they did not love the king. They did not love the kingdom of heaven. They did not love the saints they're in and they reviled us called us all different kinds of things and even claimed that we don't belong to jesus and these people would have also called themselves christians however gone to the place where people that belong to the kingdom of darkness go and i'm trying to counsel them out of that dinge and that darkness because what's it going to profit you to hang out in there and the most disquieting thing about it as well is <laughs> Evidence, y'all. Like, you know, when you are awarded every, 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 every dance and you're just still hanging out in the kingdom of darkness. Like, I just I don't get that. I really don't get that. But anyway, whatever. It is what it is. Kingdom of darkness is all secretive. The kingdom of light is all about being bold as a lion. Okay, look. This glare is all up in my grill and I don't know what to do. Let's look at it like it's a halo from heaven shining on the side of me, evidencing that I'm going to heaven. And you should probably follow me. You should come with, you guys. It's really nice there. Apparently, there's streets of gold and, like, eternal life, eternal youth. Just a wonderful place. Come. You're invited. Hmm. Bible says, come to me, all of you who labor, and I heavily laden, and I will give you rest. So come. And my coffee is so syrupy. It's sugary, like, super syrupy. It's like cough mixture, just without the healing properties. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. I prefer it that way, but I just had to put it out there that I'm drinking proper syrup. Anyway... Yeah, one must drink syrup in order to help people understand that they very potentially are going to hell if they don't do a better thing. It's imperative that syrup be a little bit of a buffer to that blow. Um, a bit of a, an icebreaker syrup. Okay, righto. Let's get into it, y'all. Kingdom of Heaven. Galatians 5 from... 16. I'm going to read to you from verse 16. Galatians 5 from verse 16. Like, I'm reading from a Bible. I'm coming to you as a child of the living God. I'm a Christian. And I keep on getting accused of not being a Christian by people who are walking in certain fruit. And my thing is, what makes for a Christian? Well, in the last days, people are going to be kind of flaccid, fluffy, and namby-pamby. And they are going to claim to be of God. They will deny Jesus Christ on the rooftops. Um, however, despite that feat, they will still anticipate that they're going to heaven when they die. And they will still speak heresies from their lips. Speaking of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as ones who aren't born again. Uh, well, of course, indeed, the Pharisees called Jesus Christ... Beelzebub. They said that he's casting out demons by Beelzebub, so it is no wonder they do that to us too. When you give your witness as a Christian, they call you Beelzebub. They basically say you're not a Christian, you're just some person speaking smack about people. When it's like, no, I'm calling you home. I'm calling you out from the darkness. The lake of fire that where the worm dieth not. In that place of which there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and the smoke of people's torment rises up forever has been set apart for the devil and his angels, but not for um, people. People are not supposed to go there, okay? But they go, they go, they go thinking that they're cool and 
We understand that God is invisible and it's really hard to believe sometimes, but when then he like lambastes you with proof <laughs> and you're still walking in darkness, hey, I'm sorry. I feel bad for them. And that's also heartbreaking to me because the reviling, like it's the reviling. For me, it's the reviling. It's yo guys. It's it's the it's the it's the, it's the name calling. It's 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 calling me what I'm not, <laughs> an unregenerate, like whoa, an unbeliever. Hey, eh? yes. Mm. There are two kingdoms on this planet. Oh goodness, man. Ah, oh, look. When I put the Bible there. Um, the glare is gone, but I need the Bible, so let's just read from the Bible and deal with the glare that's all up in our world. Galatians 5 from verse 17 describes the works of the two kingdoms that I am presently describing. Galatians 5. Okay, I think that's a bit better. A little continua. Like, yo, man, hey, hey, this is just not gonna work, okay? Mm. For this is this I say then, right? Galatians 5 from verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. So these, these two kingdoms are loggerheads. You see it in Galatians 5, like in the worst way. Let's take a sip of some syrup. Uh huh. And it's syrup with some herbs. That's why it's got particles in it. I'm not drinking dirt. I promise. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Thank you, God, for syrup. I made syrup for coffee. Alrighty. Let's just get chatting. This glare will disappear eventually. I'm going to stop focusing on it. And i got to open this door because then the heat gets too much if it's not open. Mm. Syrup, you guys. No, not syrup. This. The Bible. The two diametrically opposed kingdoms. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of Satan. These two extremely um, at odds kingdoms. This is what they're about, right? The flesh, which is the kingdom of darkness, lusteth after the against the spirit, right? Who is the kingdom of heaven? The flesh lusteth, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Mm. These are contrary one to the other, and so that you don't do the things that you would. And I mean, this is also seen in Romans 7, where Paul is lamenting like no man's business about how it is that he's making war with the body of death. It's just so rough to conquer this heavy flesh. But by the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. That's called hermeneutics, interpreting the Bible with the Bible. Um, exegeting scripture, essentially going on right ahead to explain or understand scripture further using scripture. So Romans 7 is enabling this particular explanation as well, where Paul speaks about the war that we make with the body of death and how it is that he does what he does not want to do. He does that which he doesn't want to do and that which he doesn't want to do, he just can't do. Okay, yeah, Paul is at war. And we see that war also in Galatians 5. What is this war? It's literally the spiritual war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. It is a war of diametrical opposition in two extremes. And frankly, it is a trial by ordeal. Which is why I am scared and I'm very afraid for those who keep on ransacking me with affliction and reviling. The treachery against my name, I don't appreciate it. Mowing me to the ground, flattening me as with a steamroller, I don't respect it. But it's being done anyway. So I'm here to try and counsel people belonging to that heinous kingdom to get out of it. Why? Because this is a trial by ordeal. What is a trial by ordeal? Let me just briefly enter into that explanation because I can be long winding. You guys know that that's a thing. So, you know, humor me, shall you? Mm. A trial by ordeal is essentially entering into some kind of a battle with another human being and winner takes all to a point of death. The person who loses dies. Yeah, it is a mortal enemy fight. It is... Death is the end result. It's like being in the Hunger Games. There's only one winner. Kill or be killed. So the person that wins is the one that, you know, neutralizes another human being. The war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light is a trial by ordeal. Uh, the loser literally loses everything, the winner gets everything, and the loser dies. They die, and we are guaranteed victory as those who are entering this trial by ordeal. As the body of Christ, 
Because we belong to the God of the universe, the creator, the one who made everything. Through him, all things were made. And, like, it just doesn't make sense to belong anywhere else, okay? This is a done deal. It's a one war. And, like, you just can't not. You, like, you, it's just irresponsible on the part of human beings to choose not God. He's your creator. And if he be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's just, it's not going to end well for anybody walking in uh, ah that syrup coming out i apologize i like decorum i'll try and fix that okay cool beans yeah no it's not gonna end well for anyone belonging to this other side the war is real it's alive it's feverish the lord did make it clear that it's gonna happen he says that we war that's the word not against flesh and blood but against rulers principalities spiritual wickedness and high places authorities etc so it's a war it's a fight it's a battle it is scorpions scorpions actually sting it is serpents serpents actually bite and they have poison in their bodies that come into your body and can kill you so so therefore it's real danger that faces us we are in actual peril but not really yeah we are guaranteed winning we crush serpents and scorpions underfoot but they come at us anyway, so we are at war. They fight. It's not like they leave us alone. This is a trial by ordeal, a war by ordeal. People enter into it with us and they scratch us with their actual claws. And they actually, in, you know, bring forth actual like bruises and scratches and stuff. Like, it happens. But just because you got a scratch doesn't mean Christ don't got your back. You know what I mean? Just because you've got a little bit of a, a stab wound doesn't mean that you're not going to get up from it. We survive stab wounds. The other day I used the analogy by saying that the wicked end up in the grave, but the righteous end up in hospital. When you're in hospital, you've been hurt, of course. You have to be attended to, of course. Surgery must be performed, of course. But you get discharged, whereas the wicked go to the mortuary. A war is entered into, but the soldiers of Christ go to triage while the soldiers of Satan go to the mortuary. It's a trial by ordeal. So just because a Christian ought to be getting hurt, lamb-basted, ransacked, made to suffer for years on end with no reprieve coming in sight, does not mean they've been abandoned. It means that they need an ambulance. It means that they need to go to hospital. They gotta be patched up. They need a bandage. They need some antibiotics. They need stitches. Yeah, but people in the kingdom of darkness need an autopsy and not so much stitches. That's the difference. So when you belong to this kingdom that gives you an autopsy instead of a stitch, why not leave? It's it's a losing battle, but it is a battle nonetheless. So just because you're fighting and you seemingly appear to be winning for a season, doesn't mean you should continue to fight for that kingdom. Leave. Darkness, guys, just get out. It's literally that basic. Just get out. It's that basic. Don't stay. Everybody's telling you to do differently. From the kingdom of heaven, we're rooting for you. We have rolled out a red carpet for you to walk on and enter the kingdom of heaven. And we have also reserved a party for you should you decide to heed us. Because there's a massive celebration when even one person walks that red carpet and comes in. We are not leaving anybody out. We're not shutting anybody out. We're not saying stay dead. We're saying rather rise. Okay, valley of dry bones. Dead, rotten bones. Just don't stay that way. That's what we do. But the kingdom of darkness, they're always just trying to stay dead. And for me, it's like, y'all, you are not going to win. You are not going to win. And we are trying to snatch you very gently out from the flames of hell. And at your own peril, you're like, no, I'm going to stay. Literally, you latch onto your own de-washing. We hold you with the washing to take you out. And you're like, no, leave my washing alone. I mean, what are we going to do with that? What are we supposed to do with that? It's hot. It's, it's scorching out here. Sultry is the sun. It has no reprieve for me. But the day's gonna come when we're not gonna be scorched with great heat anymore because, you know, there's no hardship in heaven. In the eternal plane where we are free forever from bondages of this planet, we are no longer gonna be getting scorched by the sun. If anything, God himself is our light. It's written in the word that, um... The, the Lord, you know, uh, he's going to be roaming around us in Re Revelation 22 and he will become the light of men. He will become the son of men. The dwelling place of God will be with man. That's where we're going. We're not going to be hot anymore. Just, you know, sultry the heat to a point where you see a mirage in the background, in the, in the distance. That's not going to happen one day. But you guys who are enjoying this earth that is dying uh, to a point of juicing it at your own peril, you are ignoring the message to join the place where the sun does not scorch because God's dwelling place is with man and he's our light. Mm. Anyway, 
Let's carry on. This trial by ordeal, it doesn't end well for the kingdom of darkness, for people that belong therein, and I'm inviting you out of there. I keep doing that. It's literally all I do. Okay. Righto. Very well. But I get accused of being an unbeliever. Can you imagine? Mm. Anyway, perhaps I am an unbeliever. I am. Uh, I don't believe in your kingdom. I don't be I believe in the kingdom of the wicked. I don't believe in the kingdom of Satanists, devil worshippers, naysayers of Christ and his kingdom. I don't believe in that. So maybe I am an unbeliever, just not the kind that, you know, I've been called on the rooftops. Very, 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 very well. Okay, so, 16. Uh, not Revelation 16, sorry, but Galatians 5, 16. It is written in Galatians 5, 16, I am scorching and this glare is still not leaving and I literally will never understand why that's a thing. Mm. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the flesh. Ye shall not fulfill the flesh. The flesh, there is a car that is very loud. And until such time that it has driven off. going and going and going in which case then we're gonna keep going and going and going um until further notice okay let's just leave the idling car behind there to do its own thing righto uh this i say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Hallelujah. The law of which condemns, by the way, because we cannot fulfill it to the letter. That's just the way that we are. We are born dead in trespasses and sins. All we can do is sin against God. So for those reasons, with the law of God being written on our heart and the law also having been passed down through Moses, the prophets, the Bible, we now have got this as the big fat chunky gavel against us, ultimately. And seeing as we cannot fulfill this law, this word, to the letter, it is within our prerogative to embrace the propitiation by Jesus Christ. You know that you've been propitiated for when you bear fruit. You cannot merely have a profession of faith on your lips and feel content with just saying that I love Jesus without bearing fruit because on that day you're going to be found wanting. Matthew 7, you're going to say, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? And in your name did many mighty miracles and in your name cast out devils. And he will say to you, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You will be puzzled out of your mind why you are left out of the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord will then bring forth this law. And he will say, did you honor my commandments? The ten of them. And then you're not going to be able to successfully answer that question. You are going to fail abysmally because every last one of us fails abysmally. From the moment we come out of our mother's wombs, our coos and our goo goos and our gargas become detestable over time. We are born in sin, dead in trespasses and sins. Even our most righteous works are like filthy rags. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? And so granted that there is none of us who do good. No, not one. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are in dire need of a substitution. We are in dire need of some kind of replacement for our dirt. The girth of Christ and his propitiation is what it is that cleanses us by his blood. We are, we are propitiated for, justified. All right. It is his righteousness that is imputed upon us because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. But when we don't honor the king of the universe and if we don't embrace his propitiation, his sacrifice, if we do not embrace the sacrifice of the king of the universe, we are still left bare and naked in the street without covering. And the Lord will not embrace any such nakedness as that because it is heinous and menacing. It is menacing because it is filthy, it is unclean, it is rotten. We commit adultery by simply gawking at the dude on campus. 
like he is a peat a piece of chicken all right just by mere virtue of crushing on a celebrity wearing nothing but some underpants with his six pack gawking at us literally you can never touch this person you will never meet them they are way over there and you are way over wherever you are at and yet look at you committing adultery through the television screen your crush on a celebrity i as a child had a crush on this member of a boy band called drew hill no kyo and i had a big fat centerpiece that i took out of a magazine of him in oily body vapor he was very oily very shiny wearing nothing but just pants however his six pack was walking and i had put a little heart on the corner of his poster and had kissed the corner of that poster with some lipstick lips yeah and i said to my heart day and night that no kill you are my baby i loved that guy even though he did not know me from above so and did not care to acknowledge my existence or even be aware of it yeah yet nonetheless i was out here having an adulterous affair with him because i was lusting over him as a child i was already done for then and apparently allegedly given that i was a child i was largely innocent and yet look at me committing adultery at that tender little primary school age i was in grade 7 So that would make me what 13 12 and I was Archie being a 13 12 year old adulteress. Hmm. That's what the Bible says. It's written in God's word that if you so much as spare a man an angry thought, you've already killed him. Mm. You've already murdered just by simply being super mad at somebody. Man oh man. I was a murderer since I was a baby. These people who are just throwing their toys at the cot angry at mummy for not buying them the lollipop for not buying them the teddy bear at the store. The child that rolls around in the mall kicking his feet all over the show making mom's life a living nightmare. Unable to enjoy any peace at all cuz this kid did not get the toy that he wants or she wants. Yeah, that's anger right there on the floor rolling around causing a whole scene at the mall. He's committing murder against his mom. Listen, it's that deep. It's that intense, it's that exquisite. Hmm. If at that tiny age of 6, you can already be a murderer against your mom and all that anger on the floor at the mall spinning around like a spinning top, throwing your toys out the cot. Yeah, if you can be a murderer already at the age of 6 with that activity. What chance do you stand when you're a fornicator after breaking your virginity in high school? What chance do you stand when you are a gossip speaking smack about your girl amidst a crew of friends that have it in for her? What shot do you have who tell what you imagine is a little white lie in order to get out of a bad knot telling a dude that's interested in you that no you've got plans later you're just going to have to pass up on the date knowing that you're going to be sitting in front of your television doing absolutely zero not hollow and ash what is be gonna gonna become of you when you lie to this dude saying that you and your family have got to go on holiday on the day that he wants to go on a date with you according to the scriptures you have to be honest and say jimmy i don't like you that's why i can't go on a date with you but you are just trying to spare jimmy's feelings and you're telling him you're going on holiday when you're going to be sitting right in front of your television literally human race you are done for from the very moment you come out of your mother's womb so there you don't stand a chance You don't stand a chance. The false witness lying against somebody in order to get your way. I mean, I could speak about all the sabotage I endured when I was in corporate South Africa. Lies about me communicated um during my case with people literally bearing false witness about me and it cost me my career. Some lies however are not that extreme to a point where you're going to out here pull the rug from underneath a person's feet. Yeah. some false witness that you bear is against your sister or towards your sister essentially saying that she's in her room sleeping mommy but you're covering for her cuz you know that she snuck out to be with the boyfriend oh you're going to burn 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 you're literally going to burn for covering for your sister you think you are just being a good uh baby sister not telling on your t and your on your teenage sisters in discretion with the boy next door Mm. But you're going to burn for that. From as early as you can have any kind of conscience that what you're doing is wrong, you can be sent to hell. Is that basic? Mm. And
And so, granted that we bear false witness, we lie, we don't honor God, we have idols, we worship toys, that we are throwing our toys out the cart in order to get from mommy instead of obeying our parents as little children. That's why you're having that little hissy fit on the floor in the mall trying to force your mom to buy you a toy that she can't afford. That is idolatry in and of itself. It's not worshiping God, it's worshiping your toy to a point of disregarding obeying your parents. Hmm. I needed to use the bathroom, I'm back, and in the time that I left, the Bible closed again, so let's open it, booyah. It is open, and then let's talk about the oxen, the oxen, the oxen that you're out here coveting, that belongs to your next door neighbor. Thou shalt not covet anything of your neighbor, not their oxen, not their sheep, not their shoe, not their shoelace, not their earring, not their marriage, not their nothing. You shall not covet anybody's anything. I'm back at Galatians 5 again. Hallelujah. And the delay is still there. It appears it is going to basically send me into eternity. It will be here on the day that I either get raptured or pass away. But it's alright, because at least we can still speak the things of Jesus. Amen to the syrup. Amen to God blessing me with the syrup rather. The initial statement was idolatrous. Okay, watch this, Amona. Um... Especially considering I've been walking around outside. I guess really I don't know what to do with this lay. Like I've been trying to deal with it, but it's there. Yeah, no, let's talk about coveting thy neighbor's oxen because a lot of stuff, frankly, that is the stuff of witchcraft and the stuff of sabotage and the stuff of bad ill intention is from covetousness. Otherwise known as wanting something that belongs to somebody else. Longing for it so desperately that you will actually walk in a sinful disposition. Covetousness? Um, cost me my career. Would you look at that? Covetousness made people make a decision that I don't deserve a husband. Covetousness made people make a decision that I don't deserve children born inside a marriage, but that I should be a baby mama just randomly floating around in these streets with a baby daddy that's giving me grief. Covetousness achieved the end goal that is my sad and sorrowful existence. And covetousness is the thing that is going to condemn the very people I'm trying to talk to right now to like not continue in this fashion anymore. It's not going to do anything for you. This is not going to end well. Okay. Mm. Covetousness. Remember when you were a little girl in primary school and you had civvies? So on that day you were wearing civvies. That would be home clothes instead of school uniform. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then your girl rocks up with like some cute jelly baby shoes that you don't quite own. And then instead of praising them, you just look at them some kind of way. And then comment on how it is that her cap has got a stain on it. You're like only 11 and look at how it is that you're already so below the belt. Mm. You want the jelly babies, you don't have them. And so you're mocking the chick's cap for having a stain. What does I have to do with anything? You know the saying, give credit where it's due? Yeah, you must give credit where it's due, but if at all you're covetous, say nothing at all then. You don't even have to give credit, but certainly do not insult an individual. But we kept insulting people by mocking something else on them that is sticking out like a sore thumb that's ugly. Given that you are envious of something else that's wonderful. Mm. Like mocking me, for instance, for my horrendous situation with hyperpigmentation. And then calling my wig all cracked and raggedy and finished off and nasty because you covered perhaps my godliness. It's like, okay, you didn't have to highlight that I've got acne, scars, and you also did not have to highlight the fact that my wig is like a mop. I know that. Don't nobody need to tell me extra. No need to highlight it, goodness, don't give me information I already have. It's just gonna inspire a great deal of self-esteem erosion in me. But they mention my raggedy wig just so they won't acknowledge that God has done a wonderful thing in a God-fearing woman. Covetousness does stuff like that. And according to the scriptures, it's one of the commandments, hey? Like, if you do it even once, you're done for! So remember that girl with the jelly babies in primary school when you were only 11? You were done for then. But now today your garab was age of 40. How many more such events have you invoked in your heart? How many? Way too many to count. And one little sin, which you call little, is the end of your eternal life. The moment you exit that never-never zone, that 
twilight zone between babyhood and you can be condemned between childhood and you can be condemned the moment you exit that twilight zone that people call the age of accountability you're done for and don't nobody know what that age is but one thing i can tell you there are five-year-olds with a clear conscience concerning what they've done being wrong and being right and so therefore are accountable before a holy god that can be condemned and you are just sitting as a 35 year old having committed grand abominations since the age of five and you feel safe mm. i don't know guys like it's, it's it's not giving it's not giving at all we're all in a lot of danger we're all in a serious amount of danger but people don't want to admit that that's what's good so they hold on to what they imagine to be i'm um, either more good than bad but if not that christ forgave me if god forgave you great wonderful and i guess consider yourselves at home <coughs> i apologize it's the syrup i did say i like decorum consider yourselves part of the family yeah if you're christian yo we're going home hallelujah but this is how you know if christ has indeed propitiated for you so that the lord does not finish you off like a beautiful mango in a summer day like who leaves that living mm. that's what's good <clears throat> like eating a watermelon or a mango on a hot summer day you're gonna be finished off okay yeah the law that finishes you off that is written in god's word that the lord did not bring the lord down in these streets in order to save men but to condemn them literally that's what the bible says that the law is here to condemn the law is here to confirm that you are condemned the law is here to guarantee that you are hell bound the law is here that you might not have an excuse at the end and say but jesus you didn't give me the law i didn't know even though the lord has written his law on your heart the invisible qualities of god are all over creation plus you have a conscience you feel guilty when you do strange stuff that's god's recalibrating power in the sky and it's hovering above us around us you know the holy spirit is just everywhere and everywhere and he is always telling us don't do a strange thing and we do it anyway with or without redemption redemption difference only difference between redemption and prior to redemption is that our consciences are largely ignored when we are lost plus the holy spirit is convicting from without whereas redemption the holy spirit is convicting from within and we are propitiated for so that that's the difference and we also don't allow our consciences to just be left to ransack us without us hearkening to them we tend to respond appropriately to guilt mm godly guilt leads to repentance while worldly guilt leads to death so that's the difference between a child of god versus not but sin we do uncomfortable antics we walk in all of us but there is a marked difference between the believer and the unbeliever because we're at actual horrible feverish war with this body of death in a way that people in the world are not at war with it they're just gliding in their sinful nature and i'm trying to help you recognize that if you're just gliding swimming like you are at the ocean rolling with the homies in sin you are not saved you are not born again all right and to go and call an individual that is born again in the lord jesus christ having born fruit before your very eyes an unbeliever because they are calling out the fruitless darts that the fruitless deeds of darkness they are exposing them yeah you then go on reddit and call them unchristian unsaved all different kinds of stuff when the lord says that i must not partake in the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them when i expose them i'm called an unloving unbeliever hmm. let the lord be our judge each then right let the lord be the one to make a commentary as to who's here born again versus not mm. so seeing as the law has been passed down not so much to give us redemption but rather to condemn us upon recognizing that we fall short of the glory of god that we fall short of the law of the lord upon spotting that we cannot do what is right we then must see what danger we are in when you read the bible and you realize that you cannot honor the commandments of god all millions of them because there are 10 that are like foundational and rudimentary but there are so many others there's all these like levitical laws there's basically just so many things that god is telling us to walk in all right the whole of the law is love amen and we fall violently short of that when when you spot that you should be scared like oh, there should be like violins and, and guitars and drums you know that should be happening you should wake up open your eyes and realize that you are in so much trouble you should 
When you read the Bible, you should see that you fall short. And upon seeing it, you should then do everything in your handsome power to find out what it's going to take for you to not be in so much danger. To find out what it's going to take for you to not be in so much trouble, you have got then to embark on that journey and discover that there is no name under heaven by which men must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Christ is the only way. He was a man. He lay, he's God, completely God and completely man. However, he humbled himself to the status of a man, a mere mortal, even though he was an eternal God before Abraham was, I am not even was, is, right? An eternal God before Abraham was, I am. And he humbled himself to the status of a mere mortal that gets born as, as an infant, just like you, just like me, and has to grow just like you, just like me. And yet, in spite of having lived on this very tempting planet, he nonetheless never capitulated or succumbed to temptation. He never sinned, not even once. He lived a sinless life that we were supposed to live but didn't, and then died the death of a sinner that we were supposed to endure but didn't because he took it on his back. The justification, the just nature of God the Father saw it fit to impute his righteousness on us given that our curse was placed on him at the cross. He who has no sin, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The rightness, the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Mm. Righto, so basically we cannot do anything for ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't rescue ourselves. We can't snatch ourselves from the flames of hell. We have got to be snatched. We've got to be saved. We've got to be found when lost. We've got to be drawn to the Son by the Father when we are roaming these streets of the world, loving it, hugging it like a teddy bear. We have got to embrace the King through the King embracing us first. We love him because he loved us first. That love is so great that he gave his only son, that whomsoever shall believe upon him will not perish but have everlasting life. The law condemns us already because we come out frankly kind of menacing, right? Out of our parents' wombs. So therefore, if at all we're going to come out of, uh, out of that safely, we must either die stillborn, we must die perhaps just six months old, maybe two years old we have got to die super early for us to not have embraced the gospel and yet still go to heaven because the only thing that enters you into heaven is complete purity complete adherence to the law complete obedience to the law or propitiation and seeing as absolutely nobody on the planet can indeed succeed to get to a certain age without ever sinning at all we need to then take on christ that we might not have to account for our folly before a holy God that cannot stand that which is blemished and so therefore will not allow it to be in his presence. But this sounds like good news, right? It does indeed. It is good news. And happy are the feet of the one who brings these good news. Cran K. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for making me a servant. Now that you know that it's wonderful, you don't have to be under the burden of this law that condemns you from the time you're just six or seven. Yeah. Mm. Uh... What then comes after that? Now, now that you, you know that this law that, that is, is crushing you under its weight can be eradicated from actually doing its most against you, then you embrace the king, right? Of course. I mean, it's the good news of her Jesus. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. <sighs> yeah. You, you're saying phew. All right. You're relieved that you don't have to go to hell because somebody else lived a righteous life on your behalf that you can be propitiated for. But then comes the whether or not I'm actually propitiated for. Like, you, you you, gotta check, yo, to see if you're actually propitiated for. It, it does not just merely end that, okay, I'll take the cross. Oh, thank God, I don't have to be under this, like, Ten Commandments stuff. It's ridiculous. Like, I committed murder at just two. I committed murder at just three. I was actually throwing my toys out the cot as a baby. I was angry at my mama. Yo, I've been a murderer all this time. My hands are dirty. <sighs> Relief. Look at me be nice and relieved. I don't got to indeed be under that, uh, like, you know, heavy log on my chest for the, re for the rest of forever. I'm, I'm, I'm good. But how do you know you're good? The Bible, seeing as, you know, we, we read it when we claim to be Christian, right? Makes it clear that don't just stop at trusting you good, girl, because you might just not be good. Mm -mm. The Bible has this to say, you guys, that do not think you stand lest you fall. I mean, that's some scary stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, here is that you're scared by this law that you can't fulfill. Then you get the good news and it's like, phew, got that out of, like, I, I, out of that. You know, I'm out of the woods. I, I'm out of the woods. But are you out of the woods? The Bible says you need to test yourself to see if you're out of the woods. 
you need to test to see if you are out of the woods, you guys. You might just not be out of the woods. Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Who knows? Lest you should fail. That's what the scriptures gotta say. And then you're like, okay, 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 okay. So like, how do I test? Against this. Against the Bible. Against Galatians 5, you guys. And many other parts of the scriptures. But Galatians 5 shall be a starting point. Alright. Because the Bible says that you will know that you are born again by your fruit. You will know that somebody is a born again prophet or a disciple or a, an evangelist, a priest, whatever. Uh, if they're all they bear fruit, you will know them by their fruit. Okay? So then you're like, what are fruit? And beautifully are they outlined in Galatians 5. These fruit are shown you. So therefore, when you bear these, you display that you're born again. But you see, there is like this catch 22 where it is that we are born dead in trespasses and sins, right? However, when we get born again, albeit us being set free from the slavery to the sin nature, we still sin. There's still this problem that we have with sin. Okay, that's where Romans 7 comes in. Who will rescue me from this body of death? That's where Galatians 5, there where it is written in um, 17, that the flesh lusteth after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one the, one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In Romans 7, the same battle is described. So, how do you know if you were born again, if you still sin just like you used to sin back in the day? You were a sinner back in the day before you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You're still a sinner. Whoa, there's still this thing. The Bible says I need to test myself to see if I'm in the faith. The Bible says that you will know me by my fruit. But every so often I don't bear fruit. I don't bear fruit, even as a Christian. So how can you tell the difference between you? and somebody that is a professor of Christianity, but the two of y'all are diametrically opposed because one is truly saved and the other isn't. Yeah, the scriptures are littered with the fact that there is a holiness without which no one will see God. The holiness that we need to wear in order for us to see God is one that is basically the outworking of a life lived in submission to the Holy Spirit in putting to death the deeds of the body, intentionally making war with that body of death. Mm. Complacency with sin evidences that you're not saved. If you are not grieved by sin, you are not saved. That is why it's written in God's word that we can grieve the Holy Spirit when we do certain strange acts while he dwells in our bodies. This grief that the Holy Spirit feels, we will feel it too. You will be severely disquieted by your indiscretion in whatever capacity, whatever you might be doing. When you lie, you will immediately know that, mm, man, like, why did I have to do that? Why did I give that little white lie, what you call a white lie? When you release an expletive as a Christian from your tongue, you will immediately recognize that, oh, that, that hit me like a log on the head. We are to have seasoned speech. That sounded nasty. How, how did that come out of my mouth? You will then search yourself to see why you so easily profaned. Mm. You basically go out of your way to beat your flesh into submission. That's what you do. So la dee da just swinging a hammock, hanging out like you're in Zanzibar. At the beachside, sipping a pina colada, having a good time in sin. That evidence is that you're not born again. You cannot just sit in it, not be grieved by it. And also, if you are inappropriately respond to guilt, you display in so being that you're also not born again written in God's word that holy guilt or godly guilt leads to repentance but ungodly or unholy guilt leads to death it is also written in God's word that sin when it is conceived brings about uh, sorry desire when it is conceived brings about sin and sin when it is fully grown brings about death do you understand what I'm saying so therefore if at all the graduation of desire to death is through capitulating to sinful desires yeah then necessarily it must be clear that if godly guilt leads to death it must mean that godly guilt leads to a manufacturing of end goals in desires that ultimately manufacture sin then that brings about death essentially when you are guilty like a monstrosity and it's just eating you whole and you are unprepared to repent, you will likely walk in a sinful need fulfillment to eradicate that guilt that you might have not have to go get it anymore until you bring about your own death. So in other words, what that means is that you will likely enter and embark on a journey to conceal your sins. You will embark on a journey to, um, uh, what is this, you know, patch up, like uh, stitch up, hide what you've done. You, you will try to hide the body. 
that you've killed, you will try to give money to the family of the man you killed in order to relieve your guilt instead of confess that you killed a man. Instead of making like Bohemian Rhapsody and being like, Mama, I just killed a man. I put a gun against his head. I pulled the trigger, now he's dead. Mama, my life had just begun. But now I've gone and thrown it all away. Mama, ooh. I didn't mean to make you cry. But look at me being a sinner and now I gotta face the wrath of the Lord. Yeah, nothing really matters. <laughs> when you cry, when you mourn sin, when you go to God and you repent, and instead of it being Mama, it's God. Like Jesus, I just killed a man. I put a gun against his head. I pulled the trigger, now he's dead. And God, my life had just begun. But now I'm gonna throw it all differentiates you between the person that's just like I don't know what you're talking about it wasn't me when you lie to yourself and so therefore to God that's when you are not then born again on that day when you try to hide your insanity when you try to conceal it you are not going to get anywhere with the holy God it's written in his word that do not be deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth so too shall he reap if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life. So uh, essentially what I'm trying to get at with this particular message is that if at all you try to mock God by acting like you didn't do something when you did it because you know that even though God is omnipresent, Karabo isn't. You know that because even though God is omniscient, like Brian isn't. And then you lie, you revile the name of Brian and you insist on burying Brian's story under the carpet and... You like, yeah, like, well, fine, Brian might not have the evidence to incarcerate you, Brian. Might like the exculpatory evidence to deal with you, Brian. Might be saddened by the fact that he cannot, for the life of him, get justice against you, even though he knows that he knows that he knows that you hurt him. But guess who can't be deceived? Guess who can't be mocked? Jesus Christ, they all, the king of the universe, the one through whom all things were made. The one who therefore also made you. You can't run from Jesus. You can't. He's everywhere. Hmm. It's written in Psalm 139, right? It's 139, the one you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That I go to, if I go to the deepest parts of the earth, you are there. If I go to the heights of heaven, you are there. There is no hiding from God. So even though you can hide from me, Krabs, who is all like uni present and uni knowing I only have a limited amount of knowledge, you, you can say you didn't do it and gaslight me and Brian and the whole community of people that have been hurt in these streets. You can indeed say I didn't do it and likely succeed to get away with it because we are struggling to dig up all the evidence we need to basically bring you to book. Human beings can be duped or tricked out of justice or unjustly robbed of justice. But that, that, that is not something that lingers with, with the Holy God, y'all. Like, it, just, it doesn't. It doesn't linger with God. Mm. So this uh, worldly guilt that leads to destruction, to death, to a second death, where the worm dieth not, and in that place there is weeping and gnashing of teeth fall of eternity, and the smoke of some people's torments is going to rise up forever. That worldly guilt um, is, is the very thing that I'm out here trying to speak to right now. Like, <laughs> I am harassed with reviling, and it's just been a thing for years. I should... You know, it doesn't get old. I, I should at this point be like, Ah, get my head to a hamdi, who be a hamdi. Can you say I got to you? Is harmless. I could say that it's just my thing to get reviled gossip spoken of like smack, but it literally doesn't get old. It doesn't get old. Hmm? But the Bible says, Blessed are you when men revile you and call you all different kinds of nasty little things on account of the name of Jesus Christ. Great is your reward in heaven. Yes, my reward is great in heaven, but it doesn't get old when I'm, when I'm, on, earth, when I'm on earth. When I'm on earth, still living this life out, it doesn't get old that people are speaking smack about me like it hurts. 
That's why God says don't bear false witness. That's why the Lord says that thou, you know, don't lie. The, you know, you're, you're the father of the devil, the father of, uh, of all lies, who is the devil, is behind you when you are walking in, in, in some kind of phantom speech. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't lie because it hurts people. I'm hurt by it, even though I know that God is going to recalibrate these skills and it hurts. And the sad thing about those who lie as well about something, people who try to conceal the truth, um, is that they will manufacture other doctrines or other thingies in these streets to vindicate themselves in a lie. Like they know they're lying. And these things that they manufacture will hurt even more than already this person is hurt. You know, like kicking a dog when it's down. It will be more manufacturing of phantoms on the lips of men, right? Um, ish, y'all. Mm.